Your Creative Push, episode 261. Take that creative push and go create, you know, make the time and do it because you can, you can absolutely change your life and other people's lives. Welcome to Your Creative Push, the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I'm your host, Youngman Brown, and my guest today is Joanna Penn. Joanna is a New York Times and USA Today bestselling thriller author and nonfiction writer for authors. She's written 23 books and sold over half a million copies in 84 countries and five languages. And she is also the creator of The Creative Pen, which offers information and inspiration on writing, self-publishing, marketing, and how to make a living from your writing. She has an amazing podcast called The Creative Pen, which I tune into every time it airs, as soon as it airs. And naturally, she came on this show and killed it. She shares what led her to becoming a writer, how she felt spiritually empty and creatively dead from her job. She also talks about the power of the law of attraction, but the importance of taking action after you have determined what you want out of life. And as such, you have to determine what you want to give up as well. She talks about something that used to hold her back, the idea that the only thing worth writing was something that would win an award, this high standard that she held for herself that she needed to really break down, and also doing NaNoWriMo for the first time and how that changed her life. Joanna also offers her take on getting ideas and her advice for anyone who is considering doing a challenge like NaNoWriMo. She also shares her thoughts about dictation, something that many of you writers maybe haven't thought about doing, some of the struggles that she initially had with that, and some tips and tricks for people who want to get their ideas out there more quickly and more effectively. And she also tells us about some of the other resistances that she deals with, such as self-censorship and fear of judgment. Just a great episode. Joanna's not just a talented writer and successful writer, but she's someone who has actively thought about this whole creative process for many years and written about it. And I know that she's going to inspire not only the writers out there, but anybody that has struggled with creative resistances in the past or anybody that has struggled with the idea of career change and the fear of chasing your dreams. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with Joanna Penn. Oh, and stay tuned for an announcement at the end of the episode about the podcast. Enjoy. Joanna, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. It's, uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah, I'm thrilled to have you from one writer to another, from one podcaster to another. It's a pleasure to have you on. Oh, thank you. So I was wondering, could we start out maybe if you could give us a peek into like your journey as a, a writer slash entrepreneur. Uh, just tell us that story. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, like many people, like many readers, I always, you know, I thought authors and writers were sort of rare creatures, where, you know, and I could never be like them. Uh, and I went into a corporate job, like many people um, after college, I ended up implementing accounts payable in large corporates, uh, which is mm. about the least creative thing you can, you can imagine. <laughs> um, and, yeah. I, and I think, you know, and I, but I was very responsible and I had the job that you're meant to have and you, by, your, by the time you're 30. And, and the problem with many of those corporate jobs is the kind of golden handcuffs where they pay you enough that, you know, you're paying your mortgage and, you know, it, it's enough money that you feel like, oh, I can't possibly give this up. But I was spiritually empty and creatively dead by that point. I did not think I was creative. Um, so this is sort of 2006 at this point. Um, 2005, I, I was 30 and I was just like, I, I just don't know what I'm doing with my life. How come I am doing this stuff? This is not what I meant to do. So, you know, the sort of the, the low point was crying at work and wondering why I was doing it. And so I started to read a lot of brilliant American self-help books, uh, got, got to love Tony Robbins and Jack Canfield and all that, and yes. really helped me see that I could change my life if I set my mind to it. This was around the time The Secret came out. Remember that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> back in those days. Um, but of course, the law of attraction only works if you take action. Um, so I started to write. I started to write a self-help book. I thought, well, I'm reading a lot of self-help. I'll, I'll write some self-help. So again, this was before, um, if people don't remember, 2007 was when the Kindle and the iPhone um, 
came to market. So I was writing before that, but I was determined to make it happen. Uh, so I wrote and self-published that first self-help book. But then I realized like I had all these books in my, my garage and I didn't know how to sell them. So at that point, I started my website, thecreativepen.com, pen with a double N. Uh, mm. And yes, that is my name. <laughs> it's my real name. <laughs> Um, I have that written down here. I can cross that off. Okay, yeah, real cross name. that one off. Um, <laughs> so, I, I, in order to share my journey, and again, you know, at that point, uh, the Kindle wasn't international. There wasn't the sort of print-on-demand um, services that we have now. So, I was really just learning all this stuff, putting it out there. Uh, and I know we're going to come back to this, but 2009, I did Nano I started writing my first novel. I wrote some more books, did some speaking. 2011, September 2011, I left my day job um, to become yeah full time <laughs> author entrepreneur. But I I took a massive pay cut. We downsized, but I knew I wanted to do it. 2015, I surpassed my previous income, and my husband left his day job to join the company. And now, as we talk, 2017, I'm a multi six figure author entrepreneur. I have 26 books, uh, fiction and non fiction, and I'm an uh, international speaker. So 11 years after really making that decision to change my life, um, I am now living the life I wanted. Uh, And it feels like a long time, but at the same time, it feels very quick. So just Mm -hmm. to encourage people, if you set your mind to it and then take action, you can live the life of your dreams. Right. Absolutely. Ooh, I love it. I got chills. And also you didn't mention you're a New York (laughs) Times and USA Today bestselling author, which is so cool. Uh, But you mentioned the golden handcuffs. And I think that's a thing that really holds a lot of people back. It's that guaranteed income, that guaranteed thing, even if it is kind of sucking like your soul, if it's like killing all your time, basically, but also killing all your motivation. And uh, I think that you you are correct, like the way to do it is to get in that mindset. Like, I definitely do believe in the, the secret and like the law of attraction, and all that, the magic of the universe giving you what you want, if you ask for it, but the, the trick is to ask for it, and then take action on it. And to realize that it might take a long time to get there. Yeah. And and also to decide what you're going to give up. And I think this is very important. So when I said we downsized, uh, we had a three bedroom house, you know, we had a car and a motorbike, we actually had an investment property as well. So we had all the trappings of the sort of early 30s, you know, um, what you're meant to have. Um, And uh, we sold our house, we completely downsized to a one bedroom flat, we got rid of our debt. So because I was the primary wage earner, um, I basically said to my husband, look, I I need to take this chance. If I don't do this, you know, I'm going to die of like a heart attack because I'm so stressed and miserable. (laughs) (laughs) And and he's very supportive. And and, and I know that some people really struggle with support from their family and their loved ones. But I had really reached that point in my life where I had to make a change. Um, Things were just I was just really miserable. And so I, you know, but in terms of giving things up, I I used to get up at 5am before work, I'd write before work, I'd come home and I'd work on my website and podcasting and, um, you know, all building a platform and learning how to run a business, uh, marketing, all that stuff. And then eventually, I went to four days a week at my job. So um, and this was a big mindset shift as well. I basically opted out of the career path. Um, I basically said, right, I'm not going to do anything over and above of what I need to keep my job. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and I'm not going to stay late and I'm going to come in at nine o'clock. And these, these are not popular things in the corporate world. But I was like, right, I am going to do everything I can to make this work. And yeah, I mean, we gave up the TV, which was much easier back then because there wasn't any Netflix. <laughs> right. <laughs> But but I think this is important. So when you know when people say to me, "Oh, you know, I really want to be a full time writer, but I don't have the time," I'm like, "Well, you actually have to make the time. Like, how much do you really want this?" And I wanted it, so uh, I made the time. Right now, do you think you, you talked about that self help book that you wrote? Do you think you were writing that for yourself? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I mean, Seth Godin says said this many years ago, you know, the book you write will change your life. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that first book for many people is the book of their heart, the book that they need to write. And I rewrote that first book. It was originally called How to Enjoy Your Job or Find a New One. <laughs> mm. And I rewrote it. So I wrote that in 2006. I rewrote it in 2012 after I'd left my job. And it's now out there as career change, you know, a, a redone book based on the fact that I had actually changed my career. 
Um, and little tip for people, SEO book titles are very important. So search engine optimized book titles, career change is a lot better book title um, than how to right. enjoy your job. <laughs> right, right. I love that. Yeah, I, th- I do think it is important. That's part of the reason that I started the podcast was that, like, I needed it. <laughs> and it's yes. funny that that mm. I think that's what people need to do is is find that unique thing, that unique story, uh, the, the unique story of your life, the things that you struggle with, because guarantee there's other people that struggle as well. And then kind of try to find your way out of that situation or, or find your way through that situation. Um, and you actually were blogging too, uh, while you were writing your first thriller novel. Is that correct? Yes. So um, I started my blog in 2008. And just, you know, also a little tip for people, the creativepen.com was my third blog. Um, mm. So, don't, you know, I had two before that, that basically fell by the wayside because I got bored. And that's a good tip for whether something is sustainable. Are you bored with it? And And another tip is do not build a platform around one book. So make mm. sure that the website you have, um, the platform you build is not around one thing because you will change. That's why I advise people to really think about, uh, you know, a wider platform, like around your name, for example, or, you know, you have a, a, a good, a wide enough thing that you could talk about anything creative, which is great. Um, but there are mm-hmm. people who have very specific websites, you know, that if their book, you know, if they change their mind about what they care about, they will grow out of. Were those first two blogs about what what, what were the subject matter of those? Well, the first one was um, about how to enjoy your job. <laughs> so mm-hmm. it really was directly related to that first book because everything I read was like, oh, you should have a blog around your book. So I started blogging about career change and I swiftly got bored. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and I don't have any other books in that niche at all anymore. Um, you know, uh, so and then the second one was was something like wealthsuccessstudent.com because I was learning nice. a lot about how to build financial independence. And I know you've talked about investments uh, on your yeah. Yeah, that's show. what I'm big on now too. <laughs> yeah, and I'm I'm really big on this too. So at the time I was like, okay, I want to learn about this stuff and blog about it. Um, but again, I got I got I decided that was you know I decided to put it into action instead of writing about it. And actually, some of the keys, as you know, they are not they're not uh, rocket science. And I wasn't going to blog about financial things. So that's why mm-hmm. I started the Creative Pen, which is based obviously you know I can pretty much do anything on that. So coming back to fiction, so 2009, I did NaNoWriMo mainly because someone on my podcast challenged me and said that they thought I had a block around writing fiction. And when I thought about it, I realized I did. So I went to Oxford University. My mum was um, taught English. So I had this block that the only novel worth writing would be a prize winner. So, you know, Mm. win the Booker Prize or a Pulitzer Prize. So I was very stilted around what I could write as a story. Also, I'd spent so long in the corporate world, I, I didn't have any ideas. Like I literally thought I had no ideas. And so I was like, oh, goodness, you know, and then he said, why don't you do NaNoWriMo? So National Novel Writing Month. So I did that year and that kind of changed my life. I discovered Dan Brown changed my life too in that he, he you know, had a massive success with The Da Vinci Code, a um, religious thriller. And that really worked with my theology degree. So my arcane action adventure series is really a sort of religious supernatural thriller series in the vein of Dan Brown meets Lara Croft. I had this sort of moment of realization that you can write uh, commercial fiction, but still have a sort of intelligence around history and other things. And you could sell a lot of books instead of winning a prize. So that's kind of where I am now. Very interesting. My, uh, just a side note, my, I used to work with this girl. This is like a, like a six degrees of Kevin Bacon thing, but I used (laughs) to work with a girl who, uh, actually worked on, um, like graphic design or something with a guy named Robert Langdon, who was friends with Dan Brown. And that's who Dan Brown, uh, used as his like character, which is like pretty cool. I thought that is Um, cool. Now, you mentioned not having ideas. Like, how did you kind of get past that? How did you come up with ideas? Did you have any, like, idea generation tools? Or was it just, like, this thing where you started NaNoWriMo and uh, just the ideas started coming once you, like, kind of put your butt in the chair, if that makes sense? Yeah, so I I think the butt in the chair stage is different to the idea stage, uh, especially in NaNoWriMo. If you don't know what you're going to write before you sit down, you're going to struggle. So the idea for me, the ideas were really about starting 
A, to fill the creative well, and then B, to kind of tune in to what I was interested in. So these, you know, one, filling the creative well. So I would, I started going to, you know, I, I always did go to museums and art galleries and things like that, but I actively went to do things in order to get ideas. So I would go to um, an art gallery and look at things. And often I would read the text more than look at the art. It's very interesting when you're word obsessed. Mm. I would look at what, how are they describing this? Um, or I would um, read other books with the sense of, okay, how is this sparking ideas? Or I'm a big, I love traveling. I travel all the time. So um, if I was traveling somewhere, I would look at things and go, okay, why am I looking at that? And then that tuning into what you're interested in is so important because, you know, there's these statistics about how many millions of things our brains process every day. But what you have to tune into is what turns your head. So if you're walking along the street, what turns your head? For me, it's often sculpture, um, uh, churches, uh, buildings that are really interesting. If, for me, it's not often people, which is which is quite interesting. You know, I'm an introvert. I'd rather avoid people. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's very much experiences in, uh, in religious places or, uh, you know, so I... I started to tap into that and started to keep a list. So this is very important. I always wrote journals. So I still have physical journals with which I hand write in, but I also have an app and it doesn't matter what app, but I use things. Some people use Evernote. It doesn't really matter. It might just be text files on your, on your phone. Um, and I write down things that I see or think about, you know, or articles I, I might see on the internet that give me an idea. Uh, and, and, and then I keep them in a file. And then the ideas that kind of come back to you are the ideas that, you know, might sustain a book. Maybe they're enough for a short story. Maybe they're a novella. Uh, for example, we went to Budapest for the, for the, for a long weekend. My husband's family is from Hungary originally. And we went to a very romantic weekend. We went to the mass grave <laughs> in, oh, in <laughs> Budapest <laughs> in the synagogue, very romantic. Nice. Yeah, which is great, but it's, you know, in the synagogue where the Nazis sat and directed the, you know, the kind of massacre of the Jews in Hungary. Um, and mm. my husband's family name was on, on one of the graves. And oh, wow. it, yeah, it was very powerful. And at the same time, the far right were marching through the city. Um, and now they've they've taken a lot in Parliament. So I ended up writing a sort of neo-nationalist story set in Budapest based on the places that we went to see while we while we were there. And it opens at that synagogue. So sometimes, I mean, obviously everyone can't travel to Budapest or whatever, but you can go on YouTube, you can read other people's blogs, you can read travel books, you can go to the library like the old days. Um, you know, there's lots of ways to get information and ideas. You just have to tune in to the things that are most interesting to you and that will help you with the story. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Putting yourself in those situations. I, I'm like one of those people that I need to like experience something, even if it's in a very small way in order to kind of put myself in that scenario. I, I, I have a lot of trouble just coming up with random ideas in my head. Um, but you also mentioned that that I, that thing that I always promote. It's writing down ideas. And when you get ideas to, to make sure you get them down, not just like to physically like pluck them out of the universe and to like get them down but to just get in the habit of being a person that is looking for ideas like actively looking for ideas and writing them down because then you know you're at again back to the secret thing <laughs> you're asking the universe for ideas and the universe will give it to you yeah and then the problem becomes uh which ideas do you focus too on many. <laughs> <laughs> too many ideas yeah, and that's yeah. you know it's a kind of different problem and and then you know at this point it's like well which which one shall i write and, and you know in terms of writing what you experience and what you know versus what you're interested in. Uh, I'd also say that, you know, probably 80% of what I write is based on things I've been and seen or done or places I've traveled in. But um, I do have a lot of death and, and, and murder in my books. And I haven't <laughs> obviously gone anywhere near that. But I am, you know, I'm really, I have friends who are coroners and in the police. And, you know, it's very interesting to look at that other side. Of course, if you write in the thriller genre or crime, um, you know, these things, they're an important part of it, the kind of cathartic experience of um, you know, the thrilling experience of a sort of, you know, a situation that you'll never be in. Uh, you know, one of my characters is a secret agent, you know, so obviously I'm not a secret agent, but we get to experience. Sure you're not. Yeah. Sure you're not. <laughs> we get to experience <laughs> these amazingly cool things um, yeah. through through our writing. And, and that's what I really love. Well, I want to get kind of selfish here and because I'm planning on doing NaNoWriMo. Um, so what 
advice would you give to me or to anybody listening or really any kind of creative person, I guess, that wants to do like a 30-day challenge where it's really going to test you? It's really going to make you do the work and make you sacrifice other things in order to kind of reach that goal. Yeah. So, um, so first of all, I actually catalogued and did videos, which are super embarrassing, um, back <laughs> in 2009. But if you're interested, they're at thecreativepen.com forward slash first novel. So I actually collected everything from the start, from deciding to do NaNoWriMo all the way to, um, you know, getting the book out there and, you know, selling loads of copies and being a bestseller and stuff. So if you're interested, lots there. But in terms of overall, my first First tip is to prepare beforehand. So the rules of NaNoWriMo, NaNoWriMo.org, if people are interested, are that you can't start writing until that morning of, of November the 1st. But what I think you need is to have an understanding of what you're going to write, because if you haven't done this before, the blank page can be very difficult. Yes. Um, and writing a novel has so many things involved with it. So if you want to have more than just a whole load of writing <laughs> because actually anyone can write 50,000 words but if you actually want it to have some kind of story or a structure or you know something that people might want to read um, then it's good to have a think about it beforehand so um, basically have a think even if you just spend an hour thinking about what you're going to write before you write it it will help you with that blank page and then essentially uh, you know for the novel, I mean, it depends if you're writing a novel or non, there's national nonfiction writing month as well. Um, but for a novel, all you really need, so you need a character to so come up with a character. They need somewhere to do things like a setting. So like, is it going to be New York? Is it going to be outer space? Uh, you know, is it going to be a fantasy world? And then they need to achieve something. So they need a goal. So what does your character want? And then what or who is going to stop them? So if you have those things like just written down, that will really help. And then to achieve 50,000 words in a month, you only need to write, I think it's 1667 words per day. So 1,667 per day, um, which actually isn't very much. <laughs> mm -hmm. So don't think about it as as really, really bad um, or difficult. There is one guy, I think, every year who does the whole 50,000 words in one day. <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah. The other thing is to consider dictation. You know, with dictation, you can get up to 5,000 words an hour. So, or some people do more. Um, so uh, I use Dragon Dictate. Uh, it's, you know, fantastic. Dictation is a whole other topic, but that might be an option. I did my, the last book I, well, the book I'm editing at the moment, I did with dictation entirely. And yeah, some days it was just awesome. You're just like, wow, I'm amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so those are some tips. Um, and then the other thing is, that that NaNoWriMo 2009, I only wrote 20,000 words, of which about 5,000 words remained once I'd read through them after the end of November and gone, okay, what is this? And then I discovered the kernel of what became Stone of Fire, my first novel. And originally it was called Pentecost, and I rebranded, retitled it in 2015 to Stone of Fire. And because it's not a Christian book, even though it's got a kind of you know, religious title. It's a thriller like Dan Brown. Uh, so Stone of Fire. So basically that, so don't be too hard on yourself. Obviously aim for 50,000 words because in there will be some gold. But if you don't get to 50,000, you have still won if you have written something. <laughs> right. and, and then what I would say then is um, some people like, oh, yay, just publish whatever you write. And I'm like, no, don't do that. <laughs> Mm. It's, I mean, I, I still don't do that. I still believe in professional editing and all that. But especially if it's your first novel, you will have a way to go. So what I did after NaNoWriMo is I actually booked myself on a on year of the novel uh, at a local college and spent the following year, um, 2010, working through that book. And then I published it in 2011. And in fact, Stone of Fire with Crypt of Bone and Ark of Blood, that's what hit the USA Today list last year. Um, yeah. yeah, so you can hit the USA say today list uh you know five years after publication <laughs> right <laughs> so so does that help you with some tips it does it does and I, I especially like the fact that even though you fell short of like the the word count and that only like like you said like five thousand words ended up becoming the the next novel or your first novel stone of fire like that 
is pretty inspiring to know that just like doing the action, uh, you can get that kernel of an idea. Like you can figure out exactly what it is that you want to go forward with. I love that. Yeah. And I mean, because it's so interesting what happens if you've only written nonfiction. So especially if you work in the corporate world, you know, you're writing these very dry documents is when you write a novel, there's, you know, dialogue dialogue is not something that people write in their normal mm. life unless you're doing screenplays people just don't write dialogue so that's like a massive change in your writing style and then also point of view this is something again like you assume oh I've read a lot of books I can write a novel um, but point of view like whose head are you in what is your character thinking you can't just head hop around the book um, unless you're very clear about point of view so you'll often see POV but the other thing I think with NaNoWriMo is, is it's a great chance to find other people. So on Twitter, the hash NaNoWriMo tag or the hash am writing tag, uh, follow those to meet some people. NaNoWriMo.org, you can join a local physical writing group if you're in a big enough um, city. Uh, so you can actually go to a cafe and meet other people who are doing it. Um, I mean, it really is a global movement at this point. And um, I actually haven't done it since 2009 because you know my timing is like right now I'm editing a novel and writing a nonfiction book as opposed to mm. starting on the 1st of November. But I definitely recommend it. Yeah, that, that community part is like one of the things I like the most about it. It's, you know, one of the reasons for, for the pod, this podcast too. It's, it's like finding other people in real life <laughs> to help you in your goals. Like if you surround yourself with people who have the same kind of goals, the same mindset, the same things that they want out of life or out of a, out of a month, <laughs> it's very helpful to kind of be uh, like alongside them as they're battling as well. You mm, know? Definitely. Well, I wanted to talk about dictation real quick, too, because I know that for me, like my speaking style, like my podcasting style is way different than my writing style, like my writing voice. Um, so was that something that you had to get used to, like to talk in a writing voice or how did that work? Yeah, it is hard. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> just have to put it out there. It's really hard. And in fact, um, some of my chapters for this latest book, Map, Map of Shadows, I'm I'm looking at the transcript, you know, the transcription going, what the hell? You know, what is crazy? <laughs> but it's very interesting because what I found I couldn't do is dictate in front of the computer uh, because I was just watching the words appear and my editor voice was very loud. And I was like, oh, that's spelt wrong or whatever. So what I do now is I have a little Sony handheld dictaphone you know mp3 recorder uh, it doesn't have a tape in you know it has it's an mp3 recorder and I will actually just talk into the recorder and I can do that while I'm walking or you know standing up this is another thing the kind of healthy writer thing and the good thing is I, so I just talk into it so I'll say you know Morgan walked into the room full stop and then I'll press pause and then I will think about what I'm going to say next. So the dictation mm. software like Dragon, it, it prefers phrases. So the best thing is to think what you're going to say, you know, press record, say it, and then press pause again. So by the end of an hour, I'll have about 40 minutes of dictated words, which is which is usually between four and 5,000 words, um, you know, and each time I, I have a sentence, I will say it. Now, I didn't used to say... Um, punctuation either but now I do because it makes the transcription so much easier and Dragon um, Dragon software which is like the best uh, you can just upload that mp3 file and it will transcribe the um, dictation and if you uh, just can't be bothered to do that you can use something like speechpad.com which will a human will transcribe it and then you don't have to do the uh, punctuation at all because the human will get where the pub punctuation should go and the speech marks and, and all that. So I kind of, I started out using a human and then I got more confident and started to use Dragon because of course it gets expensive if you pay for transcription all the time. So those are some tips and I'm really, you know, I've tried dictation before. Um, my novel Destroyer of Worlds, I dictated. And what's interesting is that this year was a finalist in a literary award, um, the International Thriller Writers Award. And that was really interesting because my voice was different. And I think when you dictate, you, your, your dialogue in particular will be better because you're speaking it out loud. It will be more natural than when you're writing it. You know, it's not like, 
hi, my name is Joanna Penn. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. right. Uh, you're you're being very, you know, you're much more natural with your with your dialogue. So I think there are a lot of benefits of dictation. I mean, for example, I walk ten miles and I'll dictate ten thousand words. So I'm healthy and I've done some work. <laughs> right. Can't argue with that. <laughs> Multitasking for the win. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Have you found that that has now changed when you sit down in front of the computer and are actually writing? Has that changed the way you think about um, writing and the way that you like? Does your brain want to say it and then you write it and then I don't know? <laughs> uh, no, it hasn't. It hasn't changed that. And I still, um, just to be clear, I just do the first draft in dictation um, and I will edit uh, on the screen. And then I also do my first, you know, proper edit by hand on paper. So I do hand editing uh, and then type it back into the computer. So it really is just that first draft. Um, and personally, I find that first draft um, the hardest in terms of creating that. And I say it's a bit like Michelangelo with blocks of marble. Uh, people have in their mind the statue of David, which most people can bring to mind because he's naked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and and, uh, you know, in Florence, if you haven't seen it, it's an amazing statue. And Michelangelo would say that, you know, he would go to the quarry and he would find a block of marble and then he would, you know, chunk off the big bits and then he would polish all the way down until it became this perfect statue. Now, I think the first draft for writers, we are creating that block of marble. So we have to create that big chunk before we can then edit that into something perfect. Um, certainly, as you know, I've written a lot more books, I'm becoming much better at a cleaner first draft. But if you're just starting out, there will be structural issues with your book that you won't realize until you start writing. So, you know, don't get frustrated. Just get that block of marble down, get that first draft down. And then you can start to hack it into something that has a much better structure. And then eventually you can polish that until it looks like David and it looks amazing naked. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, I like that example. And yeah, it is trying to get that editor out during that first draft, at least a little bit to, so that you can just get that out of your way so that you can put all that marble in there to, to chip away at it later. I love that. Yeah. Oh, one more tip. I definitely struggled with writing that first draft in NaNoWriMo. So I used some software called write or die have you have you heard yes, of that yes yeah. yes <laughs> so if people don't know it's at write or die.com and basically if you don't keep writing it will so, you can put it on kamikaze mode and it will delete yeah. your letters backwards so scary <laughs> yeah or it will play like a, a screechy violin or you know a noise that or it will turn the screen red so there are different settings but that really helped me get my first draft down because i was so paralyzed by creating perfect sentences which just doesn't happen and i was spending so much time thinking that i just wasn't getting the story down and, I, and the other thing to remember is you know this is meant to be fun you're meant to be like telling a story in within a novel that people are going to enjoy uh that people will escape their miserable lives to read and that's <laughs> certainly what I think with my novels I'm like the reader should be having fun here <laughs> right uh it's so true well, do you have any other uh, like resistances, anything that's like held you back, uh, I guess with, with definitely with the writing, but also with uh, everything else that you do, like maintaining the website, the podcast, the blog? Oh, well, I think the uh, the temptation for creatives is to do those practical things. <laughs> it's it's much easier to maintain your website or blog or do social media than it is to sit down and create something new. So the resistance, as Stephen Pressfield talks about in War of Art, um, Turning Pro is a great book um, by Pressfield on this. Um, you know, for me, probably my, my other biggest problem has been self-censorship. Um, and fear of judgment. Uh, so mm. I'm, I've always been a good girl, you know, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, just a good girl, always people pleasing. And I want people to think I'm a nice person. And when I started writing novels, I mean, like the first, the opening scene of Stone of Fire, I have a nun burned alive on the gaps of Varanasi, which is where they, they burn the bodies. <laughs> and I'm like, mm. okay, this is a little, you know, okay, this is, <laughs> This is different for me. And then by book five, I wanted to I wanted to write something around the meaning of the physical body while we're alive, like tattooing and body modification.
collection and then after we're dead so medical specimens uh you know when you go into those museums and they have these anatomy bits of bodies in jars uh, and I was like okay this is quite creepy and I worried what people would think of me uh you know I I now say quite happily that I spend time in graveyards and I love taking pictures of graveyards and things um but I used to not say that because I thought people would think I was weird and some people listening do think I'm weird <laughs> no no of course not but this is the thing it I really struggled with writing that book. It is out there. Uh, it's called Desecration uh, by J.F. Penn, which is my thriller writer name. And the book tackles some really deep and meaningful to topics under the guise of a murder mystery with a, a British de detective. So it's a crime novel, but it has these deeper themes that I tackled. And that book, I was so worried about publishing that book because it's more, st it's more the Stephen King end. It's not quite horror, but it has definitely some themes that are darker and my mum my mum read it and went what what did I do to you <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like nothing mum I you know I just think about these things and and I wanted to explore it in a story like it's not a non-fiction book on the use of the body it is mm -hmm. a story but it tackles some deeper topics so I think that's something I come up against over and over again is self-censorship can I write this? Can I think this? And I actually want to write a nonfiction book on the shadow. Uh, Jungian psychology talks about the shadow, that side of us that is the darker side, um, sex and death and, you know, the things that we're not meant to say, the animal side that we all keep a lid on most of the time, you know, and how we can use that darker side in our re writing and our creativity. And I mean, you know this, you've interviewed musicians. I mean, things like, I mean, suicide is huge amongst creatives, musicians seem to be in particular and authors, I guess. And yeah, especially nowadays. Yeah. How can we, how can we walk the line between some of our obsessions and um, mental health issues and creating things, you know, can we walk into the darkness and bring out truth and not kill ourselves in the process? So these are things I think about all the time. And, you know, I've struggled with these things myself. I know many others have, and yeah, I just, I, th I find it endlessly fascinating, um, the things we can come up against. But for me, this is the whole point. I mean, circling back to the beginning where I talked about how pointless my life was, like all I did was earn money to pay bills and, you know, eat more and drink more and what else was I doing with my time and now I measure my life by what I create and what I create is fiction that entertains people and non-fiction that helps people and that makes life worth living absolutely yeah I totally agree and I think that for a lot of people it's that that's a struggle it's it's being something that you're not like that, that fear of being judged by other people, whether it's, you know, you're a masculine dude that wants to write poetry and it's that end, or you're somebody that's like a good girl <laughs> like me. I, I consider myself a good girl too, <laughs> but writing about darker stuff and just putting yourself out there and really writing the things that like entertain you. Like you said before, the things that turn your head, the things that you're interested in and not being afraid to do that and not being mm. afraid of any judgment that might come your way. Yeah. And, and I would, you know, say also, it's really the best time in history to be a creative entrepreneur, you know, someone who wants to both write or create music or art or, or whatever, and sell it globally online uh, to an ever expanding market. So, you know, I'm just so excited about what we can do. So I really do urge people listening, you know, take that creative push and go create, <laughs> you know, make the time and do it because you can, you can absolutely change your life and other people's lives uh, by doing this. Absolutely. Uh, Joanna, before we let you go, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about the Creative Pen, not just the podcast, uh, which I highly recommend people subscribe to. We'll have that linked up in the show notes page today, uh, but also like the articles, videos, books, courses that you offer uh, on your website. Oh, well, there you go. You've just said it all. But um, yeah, the creative <laughs> pen, .com, pen with a double N and you can get uh, a free author blueprint if you sign up there and there's videos and all kinds of things. Um, and yes, I have lots of books for writers, including the, uh, the successful author mindset, if people are struggling with that. And the next book I'm writing nonfiction is uh, The Healthy Writer, which is about your physical health, uh, as well as your mental health. And there's books on marketing and, and all kinds of things, running a business as a writer. Uh, and my fiction is at jfpen.com and f is for francis and of course my books are available in ebook print and audiobook uh, all the usual places and if anyone has any questions i'm on twitter at the creative pen and uh, yeah 
there you go. Excellent. Uh, and Joanna, the way we like to end the interview uh, is by giving you an opportunity to give the final push. And this is where I ask you to reach through the microphone, grab the shoulder of one of the listeners that you've already really inspired today, and just uh, give them your final words of advice and really push them to pursue their own creative passions. Right. Well, I think my final push is reaching back to myself 10 years ago, um, <laughs> which is you've you've wasted enough time already. Like, what are you doing with your life? Now is the time. And, you know, 10 years goes by very fast. So what do you want to do? What do you want to achieve in the next year, in the next five years, the next 10 years? Do you want to change your life? Do you want to create something? So, uh, yeah, get out there and do it. Excellent. Joanna, thank you again so much for coming on the show today and for giving us that push. Thanks for having me. A massive thank you once again to Joanna for coming on the show. If she inspired you in this episode, do not hesitate to go to thecreativepen.com. A ton of resources there. Obviously, as you heard here, she has a lot to say about the creative process and a lot to say about finding a way to challenge yourself to achieve your dreams. Like she said in the final push, you've already wasted time. Whether you've wasted time in the past and you're slowly getting to your creative passion or you are trying to achieve your creative dreams but still letting those resistances kind of slow you down and not head into it full force, not making those big sacrifices that maybe you should be making. She has a lot to say about that stuff and she is somebody who has done it herself. So again, the creativepen.com will have all of those resources uh, listed on the show notes page today at yourcreativepush.com slash 261. And I also wanted to take this opportunity to make a bit of an announcement. Um, I know in this episode, I mentioned that I was going to do NaNoWriMo, and that is true, but kind of false as well. I'm not doing a novel. I'm not writing a novel. However, I am going to do the word count. Uh, so I'm going to be writing 16, uh, well, whatever she said the breakdown was, 1,667 words a day. I'm going to reach that goal, but I'm going to be writing uh, blog posts and other creative things, these ideas that I've been writing down uh, the past <laughs> couple years, actually, since the podcast started, because I have not been uh, doing my creative uh, kind of original passion of writing. So I'm going to be writing at the pace of writing a novel uh, in a month for November, but I won't be writing a novel. I'll just be writing all the other things that I've been wanting to write. And what that means for the podcast is that I am going to be cutting it back to one episode a week. So on Mondays, we will have an episode, and I'm going to do this through December too. In anticipation for uh, that January push that I did last year, uh, I have a name for it. I have this whole initiative for it uh, to do your uh, kind of creative New Year's resolution in one month instead of a year, just cramming it in to one month. And I am going to be joining you all in that endeavor, and I'm going to be writing the Your Creative Push book in one month in January. It's a big undertaking, uh, but I think I can do it. I, the book is already in my head, kind of ready to be just birthed. But I feel like I need to get back into shape, <laughs> writing shape, that is. Uh, so that's kind of what this whole November thing is, to get my chops back, to get my feet back under me, to feel a little bit more confident uh, in my writing voice as well. So there is a whole uh, method to this madness. There's a reason why I'm cutting back the episodes so that I can do a bunch of writing in November. And then December, I can start to get all of the January episodes uh, done and ready to be published for January so that I won't have to do any of the podcast in January and I can concentrate solely on writing that book. Very stoked about it. Very excited about doing that. Very excited about getting back to my writing this month. A lot of fun stuff uh, planned, but that does mean less episodes for you. I apologize for that. If you need suggestions for past episodes that inspired me and maybe will inspire you too, you can always hit me up, youngman at yourcreativepush.com or join the Facebook group, yourcreativepush.com slash group, and we'll have tons of suggestions for you there, as well as moral support if you need a little extra moral support getting to your creative passions the next couple months. And on our next episode, we have Carrie Waller. Carrie is a watercolor artist working in a realistic, detailed style, and she comes on the show to talk about her creative journey that has taken her all over the world. She has spent time living in Europe, in Asia, America, and she talks about how traveling around the world 
and living in different places for short periods of time has affected her creative life as well as her art. You can find Carrie on her website, which is carriewallerfineart.com, or on Instagram, she is carriewallerart. And again, we'll have that all linked up at today's show notes page at yourcreativepush.com slash 261. But that is all I've got for you today. So hopefully you were inspired to go and get your work done. So go and get it done, and we will be here for you next time if you need the push again. I love you all so much. Go get some amazing work done, and we will see you next time. Bye. Never miss a push. Head to yourcreativepush.com slash subscribe to find the easiest way for you to subscribe to the podcast.